If you have your Bibles, you can turn into Romans chapter 15. So our text that we've been working with for the last several weeks is Romans chapter 15 and verse number 13. And it reads for the New King James. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace and believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace and believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And Father, we pray for him this moment on that you bind every hindrance and every distraction. We pray, mighty God, that we would have ears to hear what it is that you are communicating to the church in this hour. And God, we pray for our, our children and Children's Church Hour class, we pray that you touch their hearts, oh God. Pray you give Pastor Matt and Lauren wisdom, grace. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're talking about God of hope. Uh, the Lord has a sense of humor. No matter what, we serve a God who's full of hope. And the scripture makes it very clear that our God is a God of hope. And because we are his children, then we are essentially people of hope. That no matter how discouraging a situation looks or no matter what we're going through, we always have operating in the background of our lives things called faith and hope. We have the hope that at any moment, God can turn around all things for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. The world doesn't have hope. But I mean, they have substitutes. they don't have true hope. The world's kind of hope is a hope so hope. It's if things fall into place, then maybe it might possibly work out. But the Bible defines hope very differently. And the Bible defines hope as confident expectation it's a no so hope we had the full assurance and confidence that what we're hoping for will come to pass and so we wait with expectation <laughs> to a Christian. Our hope is kind of like a perpetual Christmas Eve. <laughs> Remember being a child and you couldn't wait for the next morning to come. You're supposed to be in bed, but you're not. You had that expectancy that you were gonna get up and run into the living room. A kind of joy and hope and expectancy is always a part of a Christian. See, we're not always told the timing of God's plans. We don't always have the privilege of seeing the outcome. But every night, 
before we lay our head on the pillow. It's that feeling that maybe tomorrow. Whenever we want to be people and who embrace hope, in order to have that confident expectation that what we're hoping for is going to come to pass, we have to make sure that our confidence is placed in the right thing. You see, as Christians, we realize that What we're hoping for will come to pass, not because we place our hope in the thing in which we hope for, but we place our hope in the one in whom is hope. God is hope. And so as believers, as followers of Christ, our hope is always Rooted, centered, grounded, fixed upon the person of Christ. And because we hope in Him, then we're able to have confident expectation that other things will come to pass. Now, the last time we were together, we began to talk about having the promises of God. So look in the scripture in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse number 20. It reads, for all the promises of God are in him, yes, and in him, amen, to the glory of God through us. All of the promises of God are in him, in Christ. Yes, and in him, Christ. Amen. To the glory of God, through us. You see, all of the promises from Genesis to Revelation are in Christ. All of the promises from Genesis to Revelation are in Christ. Matter of fact, the scripture tells us that the spirit of prophecy is the spirit of Christ. In other words, everything, everything in the Old Testament is overshadowed and, and is a foreshadow of that which is to come in Jesus Christ. And everything in the New Testament is the fulfillment and the reverse of everything that was done the curse in the Old Testament. And so everything is done to the glory of God, but through us. Did you catch it? For all the promises of God are in him, yes, and in him, amen, to the glory of God, through us. So when we begin to embrace hope and being a people of hope, then God begins to work in us so that he could work through us in order to advance his kingdom all over this planet. So what are some of the promises that we are to hope in? Number one, we're to hope in the promise of blessing. We have the promises, all the promises of God are in him, yes, and in him, amen, to the glory of God through us. And so one of the promises that we have as children of God is that we have the promise of blessing. Look in Proverbs 10 and verse number 6. Blessings are on the head of the righteous, but violence covers the mouth of the wicked. Psalm chapter 3 and verse 8 reads, salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing is upon your people. <laughs> you see, salvation 
is the door to blessing. But our righteousness and our obedience is what releases the blessings to begin to operate in our life. The only way to truly be blessed in this life is to be a child of God, is to be born again. And the blessings of God are upon the head of the righteous. And so we're blessed people whenever we are truly children of God. But our righteousness and our obedience is what releases the blessings to begin to operate in our life, both nationally and personally. If you will read Deuteronomy chapter 28, I won't read it all the chapter because of time constraints, but if you were to read Deuteronomy chapter 28, the Lord says, through most, there's blessings that come upon Israel if you obey these things, and then there are curses that come upon you if you don't do these things. And that principle applies even today as we are the new Israel of God, as children of God, Galatians chapter 6. Now watch this. In Deuteronomy chapter 28, there are some blessings that come upon the children of God once we are obedient to his word. One, we are established as God's holy people. I mean, he will establish you. He will, he will firmly plant you in a location and you are God's holy people. Separate, separated. There is a distinction between the child of God and a person who is not. It's not that we're any better than the other person. It's just that we're walking in blessings and provision that's promised to children that's not necessarily granted to someone who's not a child of God. We are feared by the enemy. I, I love how Deuteronomy says, he comes against you one way, he flees seven. Huh? When the enemy comes in to attack you, when the enemy comes in and, and begins to bring division or the enemy comes in with intimidation or what have you, he comes in one way, but he flees seven. We have reproductive blessings and all the dad said. That's it. Hey, listen, that, that is a blessing from God to have children. We need more of them. Don't think you're too old, Abraham and Sarah. Come on, somebody. Hey, God, God, God's all about the oops. Number four, fruitful land and plenty of food. And all the fat people said. Yeah. See, see, that is a blessing. I realize what I'm about to say is not politically correct, but I mean, you came here. One of, one of the things to really understand about third world countries is not that they don't produce, it's that they can't produce. Because being a fruitful land is tied to walking in covenant with God. And if we ever get to the point as a nation Where God's covenant blessings is removed from us. I don't care how fruitful America has been in the past. We will go into famine. And we won't produce anything. Because being a fruitful land and having plenty of food is a sign of being in covenant with Jehovah. The God of Israel. This is why when you read your Old Testament and, and the language of the prophets. And they begin to talk about... There's coming a time when Edenic type, the Garden of Eden, Edenic type conditions will be restored to the earth and even lands that have historically not been able to produce food will produce food and there will be water that begins to flow through a dry, arid places because that's how God operates. We also have the promise or the blessing to be prosperous. Again, national wealth is tied to covenant 
with Jehovah. But now, if we begin to make a God out of our wealth rather than the God of Israel, we lose our wealth. And so, as children of God, we have the promise of blessing. Because salvation is that door that opens up to bless. All the promises of God are in him, yes and amen, in Christ, yes and amen. So as we're saved, now all of a sudden we're entered through that door, which is Christ. And our obedience then allows and releases those covenant blessings to come upon us. Not only does that happen nationally, but individually. Listen to this in Psalm chapter 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And his law, he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither. And whatever he does shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the shaft which the wind drives away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. We as children of God have the promise of blessing. And when we are in covenant with God, it is like we are a tree that is planted by a river. And if you know how trees operate, the root structure goes deep. It always is able to tap into a water source, whatever is planted by a river. And so that we are prosperous, we are blessed, we're able to produce fruit in its season. The Lord will bless his people. The ungodly are not so. They're like chaff. The wind will blow them away. Hey, and listen to this. Don't fret too much about wicked people having money. The Lord is just using them to give it to the righteous. The wealth of the wicked is laid up for the... That's a principle found throughout Scripture. So don't fret too much. Our responsibility is just to be in covenant with God, to obedient to Him, to serve Him. And whenever we are, we are like a tree that's planted by the water. And we can produce fruit. Now listen to this. A fruit is not for the tree. I've been around a long time, but I've never seen a tree eat its own fruit. But other people come and eat it. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. You see... It's the promises of God are in him, yes and amen, to the glory of God through us so that it blesses other people. And so we have the promise of blessing. Number two, here's another promise we have in Scripture, the promise of provision. They kind of go together, don't they? The God, prom God promises to provide for his people. Psalm 37, verses 25 and 26. I love this Scripture. You, you know it. I've been young and now I'm old. And everybody said, uh-huh. That's the way it goes. Yep. You started out in diapers. You grow out of them. You end up back in them. I'm teasing, sort of. I've been young and now I'm old. Yet, I have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his descendants or his seed begging bread. He is ever merciful and lends, and his descendants are blessed. We have the promise of blessing, and because of that, we have the promise of provision. Now again, salvation is the doorway that, that, that opens up blessing to us, but then our obedience... It's what releases it to operate in our lives. And so we have the promise of blessing, we have the promise of provision, but in order to access that provision, there are two things that we have to do. Number one, trust. Matthew chapter 6, verses 31 through 33. Therefore do not worry, say what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles, the nations, the heathen, seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these other things will be added unto you. We're not all granted equal status in life. We're not all granted equal income in life. Our square footage of house, or the cars we drive, or the amount of clothes hanging in our closet. What we are granted is all equal provision. 
the Lord will provide for his people as he sees fit. And the more that a person has, the greater responsibility they are to bless those around them. And so we trust. Well, how do we trust? By seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. We pursue God above all else. And he takes care of the details. It's amazing how when trust is followed in the area of finance, when you follow the Lord and you are pursuing him above all else and you are right in the middle of God, you can have more even though on paper you have less. Because God has a way of providing for his people. And so trust. Number two, give. Now, I realize preacher starts talking about money and everybody sits on their wallets even tighter. We've already received the offering. I'm not going to take another one. So everybody relax. I'm interested in you being blessed. I'm not going to take it. I just want you to be blessed. And part of God's provision is trusting God and giving. I know it doesn't make sense, but what else about the Bible and faith makes sense to the natural mind? You see, whenever we tithe, which is 10%, or we give an offering and think above and beyond that, we actually can do more and live better on less than 100% of our income. Now that doesn't make sense other than God. And here's the scripture, listen to this. In 2 Corinthians, now I'm not talking about tithing, I'm just talking about giving in general. Listen to this. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 is not about tithing, it's about giving. So Paul is heading to the church at Corinth, and he sent some people ahead of him and said, hey, remember we've talked about this, we've sent out letters, and you know, the church is struggling over here in this area. We need to receive an offer, we need to help them. And so just remember that, Put some money back, pray about it, just let God direct you so that whenever we get there, I don't have to take a lot of time during the service to receive an offering because I, I got preached. I got to take care of some other stuff. I mean, you've written me some letters and you got some messed up people in your church I need to deal with. You ought to read the Bible. It's pretty messed up, the Corinthian church. And, and, and I don't, I don't want to take a whole lot of time to talk about money. I, I need to bring some correction to the church. So go ahead and pray in advance about what you're going to give. Now listen to this in 2 Corinthians 9. Verses 6 through 8. But this I say, Paul's writing, He who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you that you always, having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. See, Having enough sufficiency, grace, and abundance for all things, for every good work, is tied directly to the ability of the individual to give. Because whenever we give, what we're actually doing is we're trusting God in the area of our finances. Lord, I really need this money. But I also believe that you're putting something in my heart to give toward this ministry or that person or whatever. And so I'm going to obey and I'm going to give this amount of money. The amount is not the issue other than obeying what the Holy Spirit says. I mean, if he told you to give $5 and you gave $4.75, you're in rebellion. So obey the Holy Spirit. But, but what I'm saying is that's an individual thing. It, it's, it's about trusting God in the area of our finances. And whenever we give, the Lord blesses us. And he says, you'll have an abundance for every good work. I'm just telling you, there are times we've sat down and look at our finance. We're like, man, we, I don't know. I don't know how you're going to do that. But the Lord always does it. And I'm always shocked. And I don't know why. I'm a little hard-headed, and the church said. Yeah. Hey, you be quiet. My son gave me the loudest amen.
Philippians chapter 4. Listen to this. Paul is writing to the church at Philippi. And Paul's traveling around, right? He's an apostle. As an apostle, he's, he's, he's carrying the gospel, sometimes unknown territories. He's starting churches. He's raising up ministers and so forth. Listen to what he writes. Nevertheless, you have done well that you shared in my distress. Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only. All right, so this is kind of like how we go about our mission support. So he's sending a report back to the church. For even in Thessalonica, you sent aid once and again for my necessities. Not that I seek the gift. Listen to what he says. Under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Paul writes, not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. You see, I'm standing here today talking about money as your pastor, as your shepherd. Not because I'm asking you to get, I don't want a gift. I want you to be fruitful and blessed. So that you'll have an abundance for every good work. Whatever God's put on your heart to do, you'll be blessed. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. Indeed, I have all and abound. I am full, having received from Epaphroditus the things sent from you. A sweet-smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. Listen to this. That church sent Paul an offering to support him on his missionary journey. Paul says, man, the gift is great. I'm full. I, you met my needs. Thank you for that. But more than the money, I want your blessing. I want you to be fruitful. I want you to be prosperous. And don't you realize that you as a church gave an offering to me, Paul, as a missionary, as I'm traveling. And because of that, it was more like a sweet-smelling sacrifice unto God. Because what you were giving, you weren't really giving to Paul. You were giving to the Lord. And the Lord takes that. And he begins to disperse, and he takes care of his ministers. Then comes to verse number 19. And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. You can't just rip out verse 19 and not have it in context. If, if, if you want to have all of your needs supplied, then you also have to be obedient in your giving. And so, as children of God, and as we embrace hope, we have the promise of blessing. If you're a child of God, you are blessed. I don't care how much money you have in your account or how much money you don't have in your account. You are blessed. There, you are a child of God. There, there is peace and there is joy. We will eventually get to that part of the text in Romans 15. That comes to you that the world doesn't have. They have fake imitations, but they don't have the real thing. They don't have joy and peace on the inside like a child of God. We're blessed. Not only do we have the promise of blessing, we have the promise of provision. The Lord will provide. He may not give you a Mercedes. You may not have a mansion in Malibu. Thank God I don't want to go there anyway. Listen, look at me. You may not have the best the world has to offer. But you'll have the best that God designs for you to have. Does it make sense? And God's provision for you is exactly what you need. And so where you are is where you are. And quit cursing God's provision for you. Number three. I'm going to close with this today. And this is just a lot of scripture. Just because I started to put like just one or two verses. And I thought, man, that's too good. I'm just going to read. Promise of protection. Listen. If you are a child of God, you have a promise of protection. 
lion and the serpent. You shall trample underfoot. You have the promise of protection. In Luke 10, verses 17 and 20, the 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Now look, Lucifer had already been removed from heaven. What was Jesus talking about? He was talking about his authority in that region was falling and collapsing because the kingdom of God was expanding. And the same thing can happen in Cairoville. The same thing can happen in Fayette County. The same thing can happen in DeSoto County and in Marshall County. Indeed, the city of Memphis. If we would just go and expand the kingdom of God, the, the power, the authority of the enemy crashes to the ground. It cannot stand. The kingdom of God is victorious. It prevails. Hell cannot prevail against the church. And then he said, Behold, I give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. And nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice because your names are written in heaven. I mean, trampled over snakes and scorpions. Now, Jesus wasn't speaking literally. He was talking about the Antichrist, the, the, the evil demonic influences that are in the earth. And he said, I've given you authority to trample them under your foot. They will by no means hurt you. But don't rejoice in that, that you, that you have this power and this authority over the enemy. Rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Never forget where your power and your authority comes from. It comes from being a child of the Most High God. Mark 16, Jesus, he, he commissions his followers, listen to this, in verses 15 and 18. And he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons, they will speak with new tongues, they will take up serpents, and if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. I've given you the authority to take up snakes, to take up serpents. He wasn't talking about dancing in church with a cobra, drinking strict nine, that's ludicrous. He was speaking in the language of the prophets. What do we, you can take up serpents. You have the authority over it. Serpents and scorpions, you trample them under your feet. And you have the promise of protection. They won't hurt you. You can drink anything deadly and it won't hurt you. He wasn't talking about tempting the Lord. He was talking about trusting the Lord. To go in the power of the Holy Spirit and to do what God has called you to do. And we as a church, to go in the power of the Holy Spirit and do what God has called us to do. And no matter what we face, there is nothing that can stop us because the kingdom of God prevails. And I'm already after 12 and your roast is going to get dry. Let, let me give you an example. The Apostle Paul. Acts 27 and 28, right? He's a prisoner. He's on the way to Rome. And by the way, he's the one who appealed to Caesar. We, we, when you read through the New Testament, something emerges, it becomes very clear. I, can't, I know it's not politically correct, but you came here. It's your fault. It was the Jews who instigated things against Rome or against Paul. It was Rome who protected him. And it was so until the rise of Nero. And so... Paul had his case appealed to go to Caesar, to go to Rome. By the way, earlier in the book of Acts, the Lord had told him, you're going to Rome. Sometimes, the Lord, oh, you're going to Rome? He's like, yeah. I didn't tell you he's going as a prisoner, but never mind that part. Huh? Kind of the way it works, right? And so Paul, Paul is on the way to Rome. And you know the story. Man, I got to bypass it all. But he, he, he the Lord... Mm, this ain't good. It's not good weather to be sailing. Paul says, I perceive there's going to be much loss in 
loss of life. Now, he didn't have a word from God. He just, this knowledge, just human wisdom dictates, it's probably not going to work out too well. Now, as they set sail, they come into storm and all of that stuff. And then he was fasting and an angel showed up. An angel gave him a little different story. He said, oh yeah, it's not good. There's going to be loss of ship and all this stuff. But nobody will lose their life if they'll stay in the boat and they do what we tell them to do. So then Paul stands up, bunch of ship, you know, people all over the place. They're like, please eat, man. It's been a couple of weeks. You need to eat something. He's like, give me some bread. Right? So he eats. He's making everybody else eat. He's praying. And then he tells them what the angel says. Stay in this boat. No matter what, stay in the boat. As time goes on, the ship crashes. I mean, breaks apart. Right? The storm was so severe that it blew them into shallow waters and rocks and all this. Everything breaks apart. All of the prisoners and soldiers make it alive to the shore. They get to the shore. The natives, like, hey, we need to show some kindness. They bring them in. They go and gather sticks. They're going to make a fire. While Paul is putting sticks into the fire, a viper comes out and bites him. It's an extremely poisonous snake. Everybody sat around and went, uh-huh, poetic justice. Right? Like, like, we know he's a criminal now because he should have died in that shipwreck. And now he's about to die this snake. They were waiting for him to swell up and die. But he didn't. And because of that, Lord opened the door and he got to minister, you know, to the leader of that island. He eventually gets to Rome. Now here's my point. As long as you're in the will of God, on a mission for God, you have the promise of protection from God. Now that don't mean that everything goes smoothly. He had a shipwreck. He got bit by a snake, but he lived. I'm standing here with a boot. I have the protection of God. I can't die until God's done with me. But I broke my foot. You know what I mean? Sometimes you get sick, but it may not be a sickness unto death. Give him a point. See, that doesn't, that's, just because you have the promise of protection doesn't mean that nothing ever happens to you. It just means you have the promise of protection until God's done with you. Now, when your day, when your numbered day is here and you have fulfilled the will of God, you're going to die. I don't care how healthy you are. So the way I look at it, quit dieting and exercising, eat whatever you want and just... <laughs> You guys thought I was about to give some wisdom, didn't you? I had to break the mood, man. You guys were like hanging on the seat. But all seriousness, all seriousness. As a child of God, you have the promise of protection. It doesn't mean that nothing bad ever happens. It just means it's not unto death. The Lord will be, and listen to this. If something happens to you, say a shipwreck and a serpent bite, It could just be the Lord is using that so you can minister to somebody. Sometimes the things that we're going through ain't even about us. It's about somebody else. But the promises of God and him, yes, and him, amen, to the glory of God through us. Make sense? So sometimes things are happening to us so that he could minister through us so that God gets the glory. Now I could go on and on, but now this has to become a part four. If you would, if you'll stand to your feet with me.
if you guys, if you guys will come back. So I've been the last several weeks talking about being a people of hope. We serve a God of hope. And as part of that, we have to place our confidence in the proper things. And obviously today we talked about placing our confidence in the promises of God. Not not just in promises, but in the promises of God, because the promises of God are in him, Christ, and in him, Christ, yes and amen, to the glory of God through us. And so as we search this book, which is a covenant book to those who are in relationship with him, then there are covenant blessings and covenant promises that come to his covenant people. And so as we see them, as the Lord reveals them to us, we place our confidence in this word, because when we place our confidence in this word, we're in actuality placing our confidence in him. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. So to place our confidence in the word is to ultimately place our confidence in God. And so as we place our confidence in the promises found in his word, things begin to emerge. Today we just talked about the promise of blessing. I just want to encourage you today. No one's told you this today, maybe. And so I just say it. You're blessed. You're blessed. The Lord desires to bless his people. You have the promise of provision. You may not have all you want, but you will certainly have all you need. The Lord will provide for his people. And so we lift up our voice and we echo with David. I've been young and I'm getting older. But I've never seen God's children forsaken and I've never seen them begging bread. God provides for his people. And lastly, you have the promise of protection. I don't know why I'm saying this, but I just want to encourage you, quit living in fear. Don't worry about doctor's reports. Use wisdom. God heals miraculously. God heals through medicine. There's nothing. God raises up doctors. I mean, Luke was a physician. There's nothing, nothing wrong with that. Use wisdom. Follow orders. But at the same time, don't live in fear because God is ultimately in control. You have the promise of protection. And sometimes you might just be going through something that's really not even about you. It's about opening doors to minister to somebody else that you're going to rub shoulders with in that environment. And so I don't know where you are on the spectrum this morning, but I just want to encourage you. The promises of God are in Him, yes, and in Him, amen, to the glory of God through us. You have the promise to be blessed. You have the promise to be provided for, and you have the promise of protection. And so as our worship team leads us, I just want you to think about that today. Let the Holy Spirit just begin to bring more revelation to you about that. And if you need to respond in any way, you just need to pray and seek God, then please have your liberty to do so.